So we have a mystery today about, <laughs> it kind of goes along with the, um, somebody doing something to ruin your life kind of thing. Different than the one last night, but I think you will enjoy it. So let me just, I'm going to get the picture of it. It's, it's not as, um, I think you'll be able to follow. We have, it's not just me reading. There is some audio in it too. The cop wanted her car keys. Kelly Peters handed them over. She told herself she had nothing to fear, that all he'd find inside her PT Cruiser was beach sand, dog hair, and maybe one of her daughter's toys. They were outside the Plaza Vista School in Irvine, where she watched her daughter go from kindergarten to fifth grade, where any minute now the girl would be getting out of class to look for her. Parents had entrusted their own kids to Peters for years. She was the school's PTA president and the heart of its after-school program. Now she watched as her ruin seemed to unfold before her. She watched as the cop emerged from her car, holding a Ziploc bag of marijuana, 17 grams worth, plus a ceramic pot pipe, plus two smaller easy dose pill pouch baggies, one with 11 Percocet pills, another with 29 Vicodin. It was enough to send her to jail and more than enough to destroy her name. Her legs buckled and she was on her knees, shaking violently and sobbing and insisting the drugs were not hers. The cop, a 22 year veteran, had found drugs on many people in many settings. When caught, they always lied. Peters had been doing what she always did on a Wednesday afternoon, trying to stay on top of a hundred small emergencies. She was 49, with short blonde hair and a slightly bohemian air. As the volunteer director of the after-school classroom enrichment program at Plaza Vista, she was a constant presence on campus, whirling down the hall, whirling down the hall in flip-flops and bright sundresses, a peace sign pendant hanging from her neck. If she had time between tasks, she might slip into the cartooning class to watch her 10-year-old daughter, Sydney, as she drew. Her daughter had been her excuse to quit a high-pressure job in the mortgage industry, peddling loans, which she had come to associate with the burn of acid reflux. No matter how frenetic the pace became at school, the worst day was better than that, and often afternoons ended with a rush of kids throwing their arms around her. At five feet tall, she watched many of them outgrow her. Peters had spent her childhood in horse country at the foot of the San, San Gabriel Mountains. She tossed pizzas, turned a wrench in a skate shop, flew to Hawaii on impulse and stayed for two years. She mixed Mai Tais at a Newport Beach rib joint. She waited tables at a rock and roll themed pizza house. A married lawyer, one of the regulars, grew infatuated with her and showed up at her house one night. He went away, but a sense of vulnerability lingered. In her mid-thirties, she married Bill, a towering, soft-spoken blues musician and restauranteur, hold on one second, who made her feel calm. She spent years trying to get pregnant, and when it happened, her priorities narrowed. I became afraid of spontaneity and surprises, she said. I just wanted to be safe. In Irvine, she found a master plan city where bars and liquor stores, pawn shops and homeless shelters had been methodically purged, where neighborhoods were regulated by noise ordinances, lawn length requirements, and mailbox uniformity rules. For its size, Irvine consistent, consistently ranked as America's safest city. It was 66 square miles with big fake lakes, 54 parks, 219,000 people, and 62,912 trees. Anxiety about the crime, anxiety about crime was poured into the very curve of the streets and the layout 
of the parks all conceived on drawing boards to deter lawbreaking. I'm just I'm just getting another picture up here. For all that outsiders marked, mocked Irvine as a place of sterile uniformity, she had become comfortable in its embrace. She had been beguiled by the reputation of the schools, which boasted a 97% college admission rate. The muted beige strip malls teemed with tutoring centers. If neighboring Newport Beach had more conspicuous flourishes up, flourishes of wealth like mega yachts and ocean cliff mansions. The status competition in Irvine, where so many of the big houses look pretty much alike, centered on education. Plaza Vista was a year-round public school in a coveted neighborhood, and after six years, she knew the layout as well as her own kitchen. The trim campus buildings painted to harmonize with the, with the neighborhood earth tones suggested a medical office park. Out back were organic gardens and a climbing wall and a well-kept athletic field fringed by a big peach colored homes, fringed by the big peach colored homes. Around campus, she was the mom everyone knew. She had a natural rapport with children. She could double them over with her impression of Applejack, the plucky country gal from My Little Pony series, she would wait with them until their parents came to pick them up from the after-school program, but she couldn't bring herself to enforce the dollar-a-minute late fines. The school had given her a desk at the front office, which provided an up-close view of countless parental melodramas. The moms who wanted the seventh-grade math teacher fired because their kids got bees, or the mom who demanded a network of giant umbrellas and awnings to shield her kids from the playground sun. Smile, Peters had learned. Be polite. That afternoon, February 16th, 2011, the karate teacher had texted her to say he was stuck in traffic and would she please watch the class till he arrived. She was in the multi-purpose room, leading a cluster of tiny martial artists through their warm-up exercises when a school administrator came in to find her. A policeman was at the front desk asking for her by name. She ran down the hall, seized by panic. She thought it must be about her husband, who was now working as a traveling wine salesman. He was on the road all the time, and she thought there had to be an accident. Maybe he was killed. Officer Charles Sh Shaver tried to calm her down. He was not here about her husband. Okay, I'm going to put up another picture here. This is of the officer, Charles Shaver. Okay, make it a little bigger. Okay. On a normal shift, Shaver could expect to handle barking dogs, noisy neighbor calls, shoplifters, car burglaries, maybe a car wreck or two. He was a sniper on the Irving police SWAT team, armed with cutting edge equipment that was the envy of other departments, but had never needed to pull the trigger. He was 40 a former NCIS investigator with the Marines. He had been seen hours into an unmemorable shift when at 1.15 p.m. a man called police to report a dangerous driver in a school parking lot. Okay. Please. Yes, uh, hi. I was calling uh, because uh, my daughter is a student at Plaza Vista Elementary School, uh -huh. and uh, I'm concerned one of the, the parent volunteers that may be under uh, 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 the influence or uh, using drugs, uh, I, I was uh, I just had to go over to the school and uh, I was uh, I saw a car driving very erratically and uh, uh, I was it, it continued on into the into the parking lot of the school and I was, I was going there and I, I just had to look to see who it was and what was going on and then uh, uh, I, I, I saw them get out and, and it looked like they had some. Uh, Something away in a car and uh, find the the the, 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 the some drugs and I what did they all over the place and then they went into the school and I recognized that the woman is the parent volunteers for the after after school program and I'm concerned that uh, 
So you specifically <laughs> saw her play something behind her feet? Yeah, it looks like she has some, uh, like, a, like, uh, uh, the pills or something. Okay, okay. What, what is your name? My name is, uh, Jay. Jay? B. B. And what's your last name? Uh, Chandra Sakar. How do you spell that? C-H-A-N-G-R-A-S-E-K-H-R. Okay. And what's your phone number? Are we can reach you? Uh, 949. Uh, 441 uh, 2242. Uh, do you know the person's name? Uh, I believe I think it's Kelly. Yeah, it's uh, in white. It's a piece of the Five U, B, U, 496. Five, you like union, you like boy, you like union? Yeah. Okay. And it has like a, it looks like a man that says, uh, only with Okay. Hang on one second for me, okay? Okay. Does anyone want to disappoint for this emergency? Hello? Okay. All right, we're going to go out there and check on her and make sure everything's okay, all right? Oh, People were drifting in and out of the school with the kids, watching as the policeman led Peters into the parking lot. His patrol car was blocking her PT cruiser. He told her about the caller's claim that she had been driving erratically about 1.15 p.m. That's impossible, she said. She had parked her car and was inside the school by then. Did she have anything in the car she shouldn't have? No. Could he search her car? Absolutely. The drugs were easy to find. They were sticking out of the pouch behind the driver's seat. He put them on his hood, and she begged him to put them somewhere else. Her daughter might see. Anyone might see. Someone must have planted them, she said. Sometimes she left her car unlocked. Shaver put the drugs in his trunk and led Peters back inside the school to a conference room. He peered into her pupils and checked her pulse. He made her touch her nose. He made her walk and turn. He made her close her eyes and tilt her head up and count slowly to 30. She passed all the tests. At some point, her daughter arrived, as did her husband. She did not know what to tell them. Shaver could have arrested Peters. Possessing pot on school grounds was a misdemeanor. Possessing narcotics like Vicodin and Percocet without a prescription was a felony. She could do time. He could take her to the station, clock out by the end of his shift, and be home in time for dinner. Instead, he kept asking questions. He was patient and alert to detail, qualities ingrained in a sharpshooter trained to lie atop a building for hours studying a window through a rifle scope. He interviewed school administrators who confirmed what Peters had said. She had arrived at the school office around 12.40. That meant the caller, who claimed to have just seen her at 1.15 p.m., had waited 35 minutes to report her, a gap that puzzled Shaver. He tried to reach the number the caller had given. It was fake. Shavers asked Peter, Shaver asked Peters if he could search her apartment. She agreed, reluctantly. If someone could plant drugs in her car, why couldn't they do the same in her apartment? She drove her PT cruiser to the apartment about a block away while Shaver and another officer followed. The apartment had a Jimi Hendrix print above the living room couch, and her daughter's art hung on many of the walls. They had lived there since moving to Irvine more than a decade ago. They had found themselves consistently outbid in their attempts to buy a home. Money had been tight since she quit her job. She ran a small business called Only for the Groovy, painting tie-dyed jeans, but it didn't pay the bills. Now they were permanent renters, a condition she didn't mind so much, though she noticed how embarrassed neighbors became when acknowledging they were apartment dwellers and not owners. This is only temporary, this, they insisted. In affluent Irvine, your relation to the real estate you inhabited was one of the invisible class lines. 
She watched as Shaver searched the kitchen cabinets, the bedrooms, the drawers, the couches, the patio. He was looking not just for drugs and drug paraphernalia, but for baggies that said, easy dose pill pouch. He found nothing to link her to the drugs in the car. By now, the case had lost its open and shut feel. In Shaver's experience, no one left a bag of pot halfway out of the seat pouch, as if begging for it to be discovered. People typically hid their drugs in the glove box or under the seat, and for some reason he didn't know why, pot smokers don't typically keep their pipes inside the stash bag itself. Peters was convinced she would be spending the night in jail, but after he had finished searching the apartment, Shaver told her that he was not going to take her in. The forensics team would be coming in with the long Q-tips to take cheek swabs from her and her daughter to take their prints and to scour the cruiser for evidence. If her DNA turned up on the drugs, she could still be charged. The next morning, Shaver sat in the police chief's conference room, surrounded by department brass and detectives, walking them through a case that had quickly seized the interest of the command staff. It seemed a much stranger scenario than a suburban mom with a pot and pill habit. He had asked Kelly Peters, if the drugs aren't yours, how did they get in your car? I have an enemy, she said. Okay, that is um, part one. Now, um, I, have an, I have the other part. I'm just going to check and see that you guys are all still here because I can't see you. This the second grade. Do you want to hear the Do you want to hear the next part or? Sorry, I'm late. You did. It's um a case of the PTA president being framed. Okay, the next part. Okay, I just want to make sure because I, when I don't see you guys, I don't even you could be gone or talking about something else. Okay. Next part. Hang on. Okay. The lawyers lived in a big house with a three-car garage and a Mediterranean clay tile roof on a block of flawless lawns and facades of repeating peach. The couple had three young children, a cat named Emerald and a closet full of board games. On their nightstand were photos of their wedding in Sonoma wine country. Hold on, let me, I'm going to get a picture up for you guys. Hang on. Okay. Kent and Jill Easter were in their 30s and wore their elite educations on their license plates. Stanford and UCLA Law School for him, Berkeley Law for her. Experts in corporate and securities law, they had met at a Palo, a Palo Alto law firm. She had quit her practice to become a stay-at-home mom in Irvine. And by appearance, her daily routine was unexceptional unexceptional. Play dates at the community pool, sushi with girlfriends, hair salon, Starbucks, yoga. He was logging 60-hour work weeks as a partner in one of Orange County's biggest law firms with a 14th floor office overlooking Newport Beach. The story Kelly Peters told police about them in February 2011 was a strange one. She was scared and her voice kept cracking. A year earlier, the Easters had campaigned unsuccessfully to oust her from the school where she ran the after-school program. The ordeal had shaken her, but she thought it was over. Now, after a phone tip led police to a stash of drugs in her car, she thought of the Easters. She thought, they got me. It had started out over something so small. February 17, 2010 had been a Wednesday which meant it was one of the busiest afternoons of the week at Plaza Vista Elementary in Irvine. A tennis class had just ended on the playground behind the main administration, administrative building, and Peters, volunteer director of the after-school classroom enrichment program called ACE, had the task of rounding up the kids. She would lead them into the building through the back door and hand them off to their parents who were waiting on the sidewalk in the front of the school. The Easter's six-year-old son had been left outside briefly, waiting at the locked back door for someone to let him in. The man who ran the tennis class had found him and walked him to the front desk. Jill Easter thought her son seemed upset and demanded to know what had happened. 
Peters explained that the boy had been slow to line up and that he tended to take his time, so this wasn't unusual. She said she hadn't noticed he was missing when she scooped up the others. I apologized over and over, Peters wrote in her account to school officials. I gave him a hug, and I thought she looked like she was okay with everything. Easter was not okay. She seemed fixated on the tennis coach by Peter's account and wondered whether he had touched her son. Wasn't it strange that the coach had brought him to the front? I kept saying, no, it's not strange. A lot of my instructors bring the kids up, Peter's wrote. The conversation made Peter's uncomfortable and she wanted to end it. She made a comment as I walked away that she wondered how I could sleep at night with the way I treat people. I went inside and started crying. I was so upset, Peters wrote. But the weird thing was she never changed her facial expression. It was always the same weird smile. The day after the confrontation, Jill Easter complained that her son had been crying hysterically after being locked out of the school building for 19 minutes and she wanted Peters gone. She told me that she blames my son because he is slow and he often gets left behind because it's hard to wait for him. Jill Easters wrote to school officials, for the record, my son is very intelligent, mature, and athletic and has successfully participated in many ACE classes. He is receiving good grades and has earned many awards this year. He is not mentally or physically slow by any standard. The district ACE director in her own reports on the incident wrote that she'd interviewed the coach as well as the Easters and concluded that nothing happened to the boy who had been left outside for closer to five to eight minutes. What then could account for Jill Easter's ire? It seemed to boil down to a single word, misheard, misheard as an insult. The director wrote that Easter thought Peters had called her son intellectually slow, not pokey slow. Peters adored the Easter's son. She knew him as a quiet kid, smart and prone to daydream, a participant in the school arts program that she had worked hard to keep alive. He would race up to her, proud of his drawings. I thought he was amazing, she said. Peter's friend suggested that maybe the boy's attachment to her played some role in engendering the mother's rancor. Peters did not know. Maybe he'd go home and say, Miss Kelly, Miss Kelly, Miss Kelly, she said. School principal Heather Phillips talked to Jill Easter by phone the week after the incident. Easter said that she didn't want other children to be hurt. Phillips wrote, she mentioned that both she and her husband are attorneys. Okay, and now I'm going to put up a picture of these Easter parents. Phillips had learned that Easter was approaching parents on campus to rail against Peters. This could be construed as harassment, the principal told Easter. The school had a rule about civility. She stated that what she is doing is in harassment and that she is fully within her rights and that she is going to continue until Kelly is gone. She also stated that she might be making a sticker or sign for her car stating what Kelly had done. Peters, who had volunteered for years without controversy, was badly shaken. She worried how the attention might affect the school. If you want me to leave, she told the principal, I will. Of course not, the principal replied. Jill Easter demanded that the Irvine police look into it. They did. There had been no crime. She requested a restraining order, claiming that Peters was harassing and stalking myself and my six-year-old son and had threatened to kill her. The court threw it out. Then came the civil suit filed by Kent, filed by Kent Easter, claiming his son had been the victim of false imprisonment and intentional infliction of emotional distress. He had suffered extreme and severe mental anguish, the suit claimed. The acts of the defendant Peters alleged above were willful, wanton, malicious, and oppressive, and justify the awarding of exemplary and punitive damages. 
the Easters dropped the suit as a result of their complaints, the school required a head count before children were released from the after-school program, and the Easters got a refund on their ACE tuition. Otherwise, the power couple lost. The school stood by its longtime volunteer, and in early 2011, she was elected president of the PTA. Peters struck Detective Mark Andriozzi as genuinely scared. Alerted by a mysterious caller, police had searched her car in the school parking lot on February 16, 2011, and found a stash of marijuana, a ceramic pipe, and painkillers in baggies labeled Easy Dose Pill Pouch. Police told something, P Peters told police something she recalled Jill Easter saying during their original confrontation. I will get you. The drugs had appeared nearly a year to the day since that incident, the third Wednesday of February, and Peters did not think the timing was coincidental. Still, she could not be positive the Easters were behind the drugs in her car. She told police there was another possibility. A 43-year-old dad who lived across the street from the school and had a reputation for bizarre behavior. Police knew him well. They had responded to complaints about him wandering onto campus without permission, ranting at the school staff, heckling the crossing guard, and videotaping the crosswalk as the kids moved through it. At least once, he showed up in a Batman costume, masked and caped to pick up his son. He made parents nervous. Peters had felt sorry for him, but now she recalled how he wanted her PTA job, how he had asked for copies of the bylaws, Maybe he had studied them and knew that drug possession would disqualify her from the position. Cops have an informal phrase for such people who do not meet the requirements of a 5150, the code for an involuntary psychiatric hold. They are 51, 49 and a half, vexing but hard to do anything about. At the Irvine Police Department, some cops thought it has to be him. He seemed a likelier culprit than the two lawyers they had never heard of. Andriazzi was a former highway patrolman who had worked narcotics for years. He wore plain clothes, a beard, and a half mohawk. As the lead detective on the case, he had been given carte blanche. Safety and schools were the twin pillars of Irvine's pride. He couldn't rule Peters out for drug possession just because she came off as sympathetic. He checked her record, it was clean. He asked her at the school. He asked at the school, everyone loves her, the principal said. Andriazzi played the call that had summoned police to the school on February 16th, 2011. When the dispatcher asked for his name, the caller had said VJ Chandrasakar and spelled it out. The caller seemed to have a daughter at Plaza Vista, but the school had no one by that name. Hold on, I'm putting up another picture for you. This is um, Detective Mark Andriazzi. Okay, make this a little bigger. Okay. Andriazzi listened to the call again and again. He noticed that the caller stuttered nervously and volunteered more information than a typical caller did, as if following a script. Andriazzi noticed too that while the caller started off speaking in a standard American English, he inexplicably acquired an Indian accent midway through the conversation, a faint, half-hearted one, as if suddenly deciding the name he'd given required it. Some of Andriazzi's colleagues believed it was Peter's PTA rival, trying to disguise his voice. They traced the call. It had been placed from a wall-mounted phone in the ground floor business office of the Island Hotel, an elegant high-rise resort in Newport Beach. Detective Matt McLaughlin went to the hotel basement to study surveillance footage. On the screen, people moved in and out of the lobby. He was there looking for the PTA rival, a five foot eight Asian man in his early 40s. There was no sign of him. There was, however, a tall, lanky figure he did not recognize, a man in a dark suit who walked calmly towards the business center just before the call. It looks like Kent Easter the school principal said when shown the footage. Hang on, I'm gonna get you another picture of this. Okay. 
There's another one. Hang on. Andreazzi's team began following the Easters, learning their habits. They learned that Kent's Easter's Kent Easter's office was a few hundred feet from the Island Hotel. They discovered that the couple's home on Santa Eulala Street in Irvine was about a mile from the Peters' apartment. They discovered that Kent Easter carried a Blackberry, his wife an iPhone, and that day between 2.37 a.m. and 4.21 a.m. on February 16, 2011, early on the day the drugs turned up in Peters' car, the phones had exchanged... 15 texts. The iPhone had been pinging off the cell phone tower nearest the Easter's home. The Blackberry was pinging off a different tower, this one near the Peters apartment complex where her PT cruiser had been parked in the outdoor lot. The lot had a code activated gate, but was easy to infiltrate for anyone patient enough to follow another car in. Every time Kelly Peters talked to the police, she had a powerful guilty feeling she said she was sure they would discover every bad and semi-bad thing she had ever done, like how she became frustrated with Irvine's interminable stoplights and did not adhere religiously to the posted speeds, like how she had once hurled her company-issued smartphone out of her car window on a day she quit the mortgage business in disgust. She was sure they'd stumble onto something. Peters found a therapist. She described how police had discovered the drugs in her car and how she had insisted over and over that they were in hers, how police had not arrested her but still might any day. The therapist looked incredulous and said, How did you get out of that? Nobody gets out of that. It occurred to Peters that her own therapist might not believe her. She wondered how many other people, even her friends, harbored doubts. She thought, Would I believe me? Hang on, I'm getting another picture for you. They had worked quietly for weeks, watching the Easters, learning their habits, and now detectives were prepared to move. Early on the morning of March 4, 2011, a small army of Irvine police, nearly two dozen, gathered at the station to rehearse the plan. They would serve search warrants simultaneously at Kent Easter's Newport Beach office and at the couple's home. Andreazzi and his team had now d had debated how to get Ken Easter to talk. They had to get him alone, away from his colleagues. They would be foolish to underestimate his intelligence. But the thought that a man accustomed to winning with his brain might be undone by his faith in its powers. So they would come on gently, playing dumb. Their edge was asymmetrical knowledge. He didn't know what they knew. The team followed Easter's Toyota Camry hybrid as he drove to work in Newport Beach. The vanity plate read UCLA JD1 in a Stanford University frame. Easter had just pulled into the garage into his reserved parking spot when Andreazzi climbed out of his car and hailed him and was joined moments later by another plain clothes man. Their questions were vague. Was he aware of anything that had happened at the Plaza Vista Elementary? At first, Easter seemed happy to talk. He had a problem last year, he said. His son had been locked out of the school, and a school volunteer had berated him for being slow. He and his wife had filed complaints, but then moved on. We didn't want to press the issue, Easter said. Bygones be bygones. They mentioned the name Kelly Peters. Easter said he had never met her, didn't even know what she looked like. As the questions grew more pointed, Andreazzi watched Easter cross his arms. He no longer seemed happy to see the detectives. Are you recording this, by the way? Easter asked. Yeah, Andreazzi said. Had he heard of anything happening to Peters lately? Had she been in trouble? No. Now Andreazzi's partner, Detective Wayne Brannon, said, Got any idea what the heck we're talking about? No. Brannon told Easter he had been following him. He had seen him coming out of the dry cleaners. You gotta ask yourself, as an educated man, why in the heck would I be following you around? Because that's all I do. I work in criminal investigations. All I do is follow people around. 
I learned their little habits, Brandon said. You got to start asking yourself, why are we standing in front of you talking to you? I definitely am. They told him to think back about two and a half weeks ago. Was there any reason he would have been out in the small hours of the morning? Now and then he ran out for diapers, Easter said, but odds are he was home. Easter now looked very nervous, and when he was nervous, he did what the caller had done. He began to, he began to stutter. I want you to use that big brain of yours. Mouth closed. Listen, Brandon told him. At some point during this conversation, you're going to have to make a big boy decision, and that's going to be on you. In the age of computers and technology and cell phones, Brandon said, Big Brother's always watching. We're absolutely not the smartest guys in the shed, okay? But we can follow the dots from one to the next to the next. They knew, he said, that Easter's phone had been pinging in the middle of the night near Peter's apartment. And if there was DNA on the drugs in Peter's car, they would find it. Brandon said, I would hope and pray for your sake that there's a big light going off, big bells going off, knowing what I just told you. Is there anything else you would like to add in your statement to me, whether retracting or adding anything to your statement? I would like to get a lawyer. That's the big boy answer. The search warrant crackled as Andreazzi pulled it out of his back pocket in the center console of Easter's car were some diet pills. They were in a miniature plastic baggie the label said, Easy Dose Pill Pouch. Hang on one second. Another picture. Okay, and... Jill Easter wasn't talking. She bounced a basketball in the driveway with her three-year-old daughter as Irvine police moved methodically through her house, snapping photos and jotting notes. Inside, detectives found, found what seemed the well-appointed home of ordinary suburban parents, a garage cluttered with exercise equipment, rooms with kids' sports trophies, an airplane mobile, a canopy bed decorated with Disney princesses. In the master bedroom, they found a copy of Easter's self-published novel, Holding House, written under the pen name Ava Bork. It had just come out she smiled glamorously from the back cover with styled blonde hair and arresting blue eyes. Like its author, the female protagonist was a Berkeley educated lawyer who had found work at a Bay Area firm. I'm just putting up another picture. This is of Jill Easter. She was a patient woman with a formidable intelligence that the novel explained, alluring to men but unlucky in love. To cope with life stresses, she mixed wine with Xanax. When wrong, the heroine burned for revenge and applied her patient, formidable intelligence to the task of extracting it. While Jill Easter waited unhappily for police to complete their search, a second team of Irvine cops had converged on a target a few miles away. This was her husband's 14th floor law office in a building overlooking Fashion Island in Newport Beach. It was March 4th, 2011. Detectives were looking for evidence that the Easters had planted marijuana and painkillers in a neighbor's car about two weeks earlier. The bizarre endgame of a year-old grudge that began at an Irvine elementary school. Police couldn't just go into Easter's office and rifle through his files. They were full of confidential information about his clients. Hold on, I'm just getting another picture for you. This is Kent Easter's um, office. He was earning $400,000 a year as a litigator. For the search, they relied on Paul Jensen, a personal injury lawyer who also served as an unpaid special master for the courts. He would take what looked relevant and leave the rest. That morning when Jensen showed up at the Irvine Police Department for the operational briefing. Oh, hang on, Jimmy's okay. He counted a throng of cops, maybe 15 or 20, and then it seemed like overkill. They were ready for Pablo Escobar. Kent Easter is a lawyer, he thought. He's not a mafioso. But now, 
As he went through Easter's papers, Jensen was happy the police were there in force, standing guard at the door. Some of the law firm's employees were raising a clamor, confronting the cops. Why are you here? What gives you the right? This is Newport Beach, not Irvine. Only after a cop threatened someone with an arrest did things quiet down. Neither of the Easters were arrested that day. The evidence seized include, included the couple's smartphones. Detectives believed the contents might clinch the case. But the phones were soon locked up inside the chambers of an Orange County judge, where they would languish as legal arguments raged. Easter's firm wanted his BlackBerry back because it had sensitive client information. The Easter's criminal defense attorneys wanted evidence on both phones kept from the police, citing attorney-client and spousal privileges. It was complicated enough to bring a case against two attorneys, even more so when they were married to each other. At times, the case approached the threshold of a farce, a mashup of Benny Hill, David Lynch, and Desperate Housewives. Into the story on the very morning of the search warrants were served, stumbling, stumbled a strapping, off-duty firefighter, Jill Easter's married paramour. Detectives were sitting in an unmarked car, waiting to approach the Easter house when the firefighter came strolling up the block and spotted them. He took off, holding a phone to his ear. Jill Easter emerged from the house in a negligee. By detectives' accounts, by detectives' account, then noticed the cops herself and hurried back inside. Police stopped the firefighter as he pulled away in his pickup. His name was Glenn Gomez. He, he drove an engine for Los Angeles Fire Department Station House, 50 miles north. He said he was in town to visit a beautiful Swedish girl. Her name is Jill. Their affair had been going on for two and a half years. They arranged trysts, swapped explicit photos, and traded exuberantly pornographic text. Court records would show. She called him her sex ninja pappy and Mr. Delicious, and he called her his sex goddess, baby girl, and Mrs. Delicious. Gomez's records, phone records show, showed he hadn't been near the scene of the drug planting, but detectives hoped to enlist his help. They were tight-lipped with details, but told him that he was in the middle of something very serious something that could hurt both his family and his career. They kept saying, she'll ruin you. He kept saying, I love her. Would he wear a wire, police asked. On March 23rd, nearly three weeks after the warrants were served, he agreed. He wanted to show he had nothing to hide and seemed to have a second motive, curiosity. He met her at a park down the block from her house and she brought her two youngest children. She told them her male friend was the park ranger. She told them to go play. There was a playground with a sandbox, swing, slide, and a seesaw. Hang on, I'm getting another picture. As investigators listened listened in, Gomez, who had been given the loose script, a loose script, told the cops told her cops had been asking him questions. He wanted to know what it was all about. She was in some kind of trouble, she said, but she wouldn't give him details. I really can't afford to have this type of investigation be because my husband could lose his job, she said. I'm going to tell them the truth. I mean, it's not a crime to have a beautiful girlfriend, Gomez said. He said he thought they should keep their distance for a while. As much as I care for you and love you, it's probably not a smart thing for us to be like talking right now because of what's going on and stuff. He pressed her. I just hope that you are who I think you are, he said, and I'm pretty sure you are. I'm 99.999% positive. But when I have a detective calling me, it makes you wonder a little bit, that's all. Easter accused him of abandoning her. I thought that if I ever had some trouble in my life or sadness, that I would have someone to stand beside me, and I don't, she said. It's a hard lesson to learn. She continued to scold him. I don't even know what I need, she said. I need someone like you see in the movies to come in and help. He persisted. Why were the cops asking him questions? Do you think I know, she replied. I'm waiting for someone to help me. 
I'm losing everything here. I don't know. Well, if you haven't done anything wrong, then you should be fine. Her, ter her tone was growing angrier and angrier. I'm not going to be fine. Do you understand me? Don't just put your head in the sand. This is the moment. This is when I needed someone and you turned your back on me. And I will not survive this. I have tried to tell you that I'm having a problem and you just ignore it. And it is too late. And if you tell me you want to come down here and you think I did something, why? Well, how have I ever done to make you think that? Because they're calling me and asking me all these questions about the school. Please continue with part two.